Hello, and welcome to People of the Pod, brought to you by American Jewish Committee. Each week, we take you beyond the headlines to help you understand what they all mean for America, Israel, and the Jewish people. I'm your host, Manya Brashear Pashman. We've suffered because of our stand, which was not uh, just obstinacy, just because we liked it that this way. But I think it uh, it has been accepted more and more that we have uh, something uh, at stake, and that that's our very existence. Whether the borders are such that we can defend them or not, is uh, is a question of to be or not to be. That's the late Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, speaking with AJC about fighting wars to defend Israel's existence. The movie Golda, premiering in American theaters this week, tells the story of one such battle, the Yom Kippur War of 1973, when Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack against the Jewish state. Here to talk about the movie and why it's an important story to share with the world, especially through Golda Meir's eyes, is its Academy Award-winning director, Guy Nativ. Guy, welcome to People of the Pod. Hi, Mania. So, Guy, as we just heard from Golda Meir herself, Israel has been defending its very existence since its creation in war after war after war. Why did you want to direct a film about this particular war, which turned out to be quite a turbulent moment in the life of the Jewish state? I was born into this war, in a way. I'm the, from the children of 73. My mom ran to the shelter with me as a baby. My father went to the war. And I grew up on those stories of Golda, of the war, and I really wanted to know more, but there wasn't any way of knowing more. And I think that 10 years ago, protocols came out and gave a sense of what really happened. You know, protocols from the Agrarian Committee, from the war rooms, from the from the government, um, all those uh, disclass- disclassified uh, documents. And that shed a different light on what really happened there and on Golda. And doing the research on Golda, talking to people who really knew her, um, gave me sense of why we need to tell this story. And it's for my generation and for the generation of my fathers and mothers. So who made the decision to cast Helen Mirren as Golda Meir? I wasn't the one who cast Helen. Uh, When I came on board, Helen was already uh, attached. Uh, I think that Gideon uh, Meir, the grandson, he was the one who thought about Helen first. He said, I see my my grandmother in in her. And when I came, she she already read the script and it was only meeting me to close the circle. And what did she bring to the role? Humor, humanity, wisdom, charm. It's all there, but she brings a lot of human depth to the character. Were there conversations uh, off camera uh, during the making of the film about Israel, about its history, about the lessons learned in this moment in its history with Helen Mirren or other cast members? Yeah, but the problem that we don't really learn, right? Because Look what happened now in Israel. It's the own keeper of democracy. So I don't think we learned enough. We are basically in the same situation as 73, in a way, with a leader that is uh, so disattached. At least Golda believed in the judicial system. She believed in the high court. She was a humanist. She believed in democracy, full democracy. And I think the situation now is so dire and... When I went to protest in Israel, I went to protest with a lot of veterans from the war who had the T-shirt, this is the Yom Kippur of democracy. We were fighting, we, they, they're almost fighting again, but this time not because of our enemies, because of ourselves. So we're eating ourselves from within. I'm so glad you mentioned the veterans of the war because this was such a painful conflict for Israel, such a tragic blow to the nation's psyche. More than 2,600 Israeli soldiers were killed. 12,000 injured, nearly 300 taken prisoner. What do you believe this film offers those veterans? I think it brings a lot of humanity to Golda, who they saw as just a poster, as just a stamp, as just a statue, right? She was somebody who's not human. And I thought that Helen, in the way that the film is structured, is bringing Golda in a human way, and they see her struggle. 
and how she cared about those veterans, how she cared about every single person, every single soldier that died in this war. She wrote every name. She took it to her heart. And I thought that was something that veterans would respect. And I also, what I did is when I edited the film, I brought five veterans from the front. A lot of them watched the movie in the first cut, the really first offline cut. And they helped me shape the narrative and bring their own perspective to this movie. So I thought, I thought that was very um, cool. You've made it clear that this is not a biopic about Golda Meir, right? This is really about this moment in history. No, it's not your classical biopic. If you want to do a biopic about Golda Meir, you'll have to have a mini series with eight episodes or more. This is an hour and a half on a very specific magnifying glass on the requiem of a country, a requiem of a leader, the last of Golda, the last days. Let's listen to a clip from the film that really shows why Golda Meir was known as the Iron Lady of Israeli politics. Here's Helen Mirren as Golda Meir sitting across the table from Henry Kissinger, played by actor Liev Schreiber. This country is traumatized. My generals are begging me to occupy Cairo. Sharon is, a, is like a dog on the leash. If you do that, you'll be on your own. Israel's long-term interests will not be served by a fracturing of our relationship, Golda. Sadat has already agreed to the terms of the ceasefire. Of course he has. He's on the brink of defeat. It will give him a chance to regroup. You are the only person in the world who could possibly understand what I'm going through. Yes, I know how you feel, but we need a ceasefire. I thought we were friends, Henry. We will always protect Israel. Like you did in 48? We had to get our weapons from Stalin. Stalin! Our survival is not in your gift. If we have to, we will fight alone. So, Guy, what would you include in a miniseries if you produced a miniseries instead? I would go to her childhood in Ukraine, probably. I would show her family in Israel. I would show more of her relationship with Luke Dar. They were really close, her assistant. There's a lot of things that I would do, but not in a format of a feature. Although, if you want to do something like, you know, four and a half hours feature, like, you know, they used to be in the 80s or in the 70s, they were massive, like, you know, gone with the wind. This is something else. But this is not this movie. This movie is really like a specific time in history. Through her eyes, basically. Through her eyes. Yeah. I would call it under her skin. I'm curious if in the making of the film, there were any kind of surprising revelations about cast members or you know their perspectives, their opinions, or revelations about the history itself. One of the guys that was a stand-in, he was an extra in the movie. He was in the table of all the ministers. Efri, Efraim, his name is. I played the siren in the room, so everybody will get the siren and the long siren, and he started crying. And he said, I'm sorry, I cannot really stay here for long. And I asked him, why not? He said, because I'm a veteran of the war. I was 21 when I went to the tunnel and I fought. He lives in the UK and we shot the film in the UK and he came and it was amazing. And he came to Helen and, and me and he showed us photos of him as a 21 year old uh, from the war. It was very emotional. That was surprising. He's suddenly this, you know, extra who is war veteran, who's Did playing he? a minister. Wow. Did he explain why he tried out or auditioned to be an extra, why he wanted to do this? He's doing a lot of extra work in the UK. You know, he moved to the UK and he's extra in a lot of movies. And that, and when he saw that this movie exists, he said, I, I must come. I must be one of those ministers. And we needed a desk full of ministers, you know, and he was the right age. So he's just an extra. That's what he does. I don't know if he thought that he would be in the same situation. I don't think that he thought that because he didn't read the script. So it was a very emotional moment, a very emotional moment for her. This was filmed in the UK? It was filmed in an Indian school outside of London, the Indian abandoned school that was basically huge, like massive. Arad Shawat, who is my production designer, he basically created the entire Kiriyah 
and the war room and all the bunker and Golda's kitchen, he built it from scratch exactly like it was in Israel. And it was crazy. It's just like walking into the 70s, me as a grown up, you know, and seeing Helen as Golda and the commanders. It was surreal, just surreal. And how did you gather those kinds of personal details about her life? In other words, did you have pictures, plenty of photographs to base that on? And My two sources were Adam, her bodyguard, that gave me all the information, and her press secretary, who was 91, who told me everything about her and books that were available for us and protocols. It was very specific protocols that showed us how everything went down. Did Helen spend a lot of time with those people as well to really get a sense? And I'm curious how else she prepared, if you know, how else she prepared for this role to really embody the former prime minister. It was her own private process. I didn't get into it so much. But I think that she read all the books. She worked with a dialect coach to understand how the Milwaukee accent, to talk as any Milwaukee accent, walk the walk. I think she prepared also with animal coach. There's a coach that, you know, every actor becomes, every role is your different animal. And you behave like this animal. You take the physics of this animal. I think she was a turtle. I think that Golda was more of a turtle. The way she spoke, everything was so slow. The way she carried herself like a ship. So it was a lot of metaphors, a lot of stuff, a lot of tools that help actors get into the role. But when I met her, that was after like three and a half months we didn't talk, she was Golda. It's almost like she got into the trailer as Helen and she came out as Golda. We didn't see Helen. We saw Golda. Even when we spoke and we ate lunch with her, we saw Golda. And at the end of the 37 days of shooting, I was like, you know, I don't remember how you look like, Helen. And only in Berlin Film Festival, when she came as Helen Mirren, is like where we really saw her. So you mentioned Berlin. The film has premiered there in Berlin. It also has premiered in Israel. I'm curious how audiences have received it in both places. Has it hit different chords in different countries? When non-Jews see the movie, I mean, they have lots of emotional baggage, right? And they see it as something foreign in a way, right? But for Jews, for Israelis, there's a lot of emotional aspect to it. It's a different view, but... A lot of people that are not Jews are also really like, hmm, this is such an interesting, we didn't even know about her. You know, a lot of people are learning who she was and they didn't know. It's like she paved the way to Margaret Thatcher and to Angela Merkel. So, you know, they see now what's the origin of that. That's a really wonderful point. It being filmed in the UK and premiering in Berlin. Merkel <laughs> said that Golda was her inspiration. So how do you expect it to resonate here in the United States? I really feel that it's just starting out right now. We had an um, academy screening and I'm getting amazing text messages from people from that generation. But I also would love for younger generation to know about that and explore Golda. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested to know to see how it is, but I know that it's very emotional for the Jewish community. I can feel that. Do you think this film will change how people view Golda Meir and Israel's leaders in general? I hope it will spark a nerve in a way that we are in the same situation now and people will see that history repeats itself in a way. It's not the same exact situation, but it's the blindness that our leaders are in right now. I hope it will bring a different narrative to the character of Golda and who she was, not just the poster, not just the scapegoat, because she was the scapegoat of this war. They, it was easy to blame her for all the faults of her commanders and all the other human intelligent commanders and what happened there. But she's not the only one. She's not the scapegoat. She was actually very valuable for Israel because she brought the shipments from the States of the planes and the weapon. And, you know, she was in charge of it. And I think without that, we would probably find ourselves in a different situation. Golda was the first female head of government in the Middle East. Do you think her gender had something to do with her being blamed or being labeled the scapegoat, as you said? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I truly believe that with more female leaders in this world, the, the world will be a better place. I feel that men proved us wrong. You know, I want to see Tipi Livni leading Israel again. 
I want to see more women in key roles in leading countries. I think the world will be a better place. Guy, thank you so much. Really appreciate you sitting down with us. Thank you. If you missed last week's episode, be sure to tune in for my conversation with Felix Klein, Germany's federal government commissioner for Jewish life and the fight against anti-Semitism. He explains the rise of Germany's far-right party and what it means for German Jews. Thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by AJC. Our producer is Atara Lakritz. Our sound engineer is TK Broderick. You can subscribe to People of the Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or learn more at ajc.org slash people of the pod. The views and opinions of our guests don't necessarily reflect the positions of AJC. We'd love to hear your views and opinions or your questions. You can reach us at peopleofthepod at ajc.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to tell your friends, tag us on social media with hashtag people of the pod, and hop on to Apple Podcasts to rate us and write a review to help more listeners find us. Tune in next week for another episode of People of the Pod.